Welcome. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bob Lloyd, and with me today is my colleague, Pat O'Connor. And we are going to talk to you about a topic that's near and dear to our hearts. It's something that we've been working on for many years, that is trying to build capability and capacity within organizations to help improve their quality strategies, their quality deployment. So what we want to do is share with you examples that we've garnered from around the world. Even though I am from the United States, I work for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and Pat works in Scotland uh, with Health Improvement Scotland, an organization we've worked with for many years. Uh, we want to share some stories with you uh, from around the world and then challenge you with some worksheets to see if you can start actually picking apart the issues that are holding you back from world-class demonstration of your improvement strategies. These are the topics we're going to cover today. We're going to start broad and set some context for improvement strategies in general, define some of the terms that we think have been critical, particularly as we've tried to deploy quality thinking, but also as people have confused themselves about what quality improvement capacity is all about. I think as you look at what quality is trying to achieve, there are a number of interesting statements. I have found this. This is from a, a gentleman <clears throat> who was a businessman in the early 1940s in the United States. And I always thought it was rather clever how he talked about the fact that quality is never an accident. And what we see is a lot of people that mouth the words and say, we're doing quality. And when you look at them and ask them, what does that actually look and feel like, you get a very different picture. It's always the result of high intention, sincere effort, intelligent direction, and skillful execution. I think this fellow really laid out nicely, back in the early 40s, one of the key ingredients, that it is not something that you just put into your mission statement and then go about advertising that, in fact, you do it. But how do we look at the very fabric of the organization and, on a daily basis, see the fact that everyone is working in the same way and that the system as a totality is actually moving ahead. Not one department, not one ward, but the system as a totality. So it struck me as rather interesting when you look at the things that people say they do that demonstrate quality. And here's some of the ones that I've put together, uh, rather tongue in cheek actually, uh, particularly the last point on this list. But it's funny to us how people say, well, we've we heard about Deming. We could spell Deming. We could talk about Deming's Out of the Crisis. We read part of that book one time. We've heard something about Joseph Duran. We've done this, we've done that. We applied for a quality award. We're in the top decile in our comparative database uh, that our country, our province puts out. Uh, these things are all shallow, actually. And so one of the things that you've really got to think about is, as trite as it may seem, using my Star Trek example, this really is trying to go boldly where many people don't go. Uh, again, lip service is very cheap, but if you're really going to try to build capacity and capability in a sustained way, you've got to put together a number of things that are going to be able to demonstrate reliability, sustainability, and the ability to execute under different conditions and different parameters. And that also then gets played out into one of the things that we talk about at the IHI consistently, and that is a simple aim that is structured about how good do you want to be and by when. Many healthcare people easily talk about how they want to be in the top decile, they want to be recognized as being excellent, et cetera, et cetera. But then you ask them, when do you plan to achieve this? Oh, well, we just hope to get better. We expect to get better. We want to get better, but it's very hard for them to put a date on it. So many of the projects that we work with around the world, we ask people to very clearly specify how good do you want to be and by when. And I would say that that same thing applies to thinking about building capacity and capability within your own organization. So the journey really starts by thinking about how capacity in your organization is structured to receive ideas about quality improvement. Because it's something that most healthcare professionals, whether you be a physician, a nurse, physiotherapist, a medic, an administrator, they really do not get this type of knowledge in traditional programs that we teach. 
You've got to find out organizations that do or seek other venues which you can allow yourself to understand, first of all, what is the capacity within my own organization. Capacity is basically potential energy. When you move to capability, that's where it becomes actual and potential energy. So it's this issue between potential and kinetic energy that really is the hallmark of thinking about both capacity and capability, and we're going to further define these terms in a moment. Those two things combined should allow you to have sustainable improvement and sustainable expansion of the knowledge within the organization that eventually lead to excellence. So the first thing we'd like you to do is to use one of our worksheets that we've developed and to think about several things. I'd like you to think about where you are in your current journey. That is, be able to look and identify several things. And if you're with a colleague from your own organization, just chat briefly about this. So I want you to do two things. First of all, to look at where are we right now? Have we completed this activity? Is it in process? Or is it not even started yet? And that comes by looking at this column right here. What's the current status? And then the ideas over here, the concepts, are aspects of capacity building. And I just want you to take a couple minutes and think about where you are in this journey currently, and then what is the future prior priority over the next 6 to 12 months? Is it high, medium, or low in terms of how you actually see yourself putting some time, effort, energy, and influence behind these things. So just take a few minutes, use this first worksheet, and give yourself an assessment. Uh, we want you to give this as a baseline so that as we go on and explain some of the issues, the concepts, and the principles, you'll at least be able to compare these ideas to where you think you are currently. So we'll give you a couple minutes and just start looking at this. If you don't have uh, the actual worksheets, they should be in the packets in the back of the room. Uh, I apologize, I'm not sure why our screen is still a little foggy, but uh, hopefully you'd be able to read that and uh, discern it even if you don't have the worksheet. All right, so take a couple minutes and just think about some of these things, uh, about how you're setting the structural foundation for actually making improvements. All right, we just wanted to give you a <clears throat> flavor for starting to use it. We've developed a number of these worksheets for you. Hopefully that you'll take them back and start using them with teams and organizational leaders within your own structure. But we just wanted to give you a sense for some of the things that <clears throat> over the years people have identified through such things as the Quality Award in Europe, the Baldrige Award in the United States, other places that look at an organization and say, what are the components of quality? And so as you scan this list, you'll see it starts kind of at the high level of evaluating your organization's mission, values, structures, and then moves into some of the specifics, education, how you're restructuring, do you have departments of quality, or do you say that those people that do all these other activities, in addition, now they're going to do quality. Uh, do you mix quality assurance with quality improvement? Where does risk management fit in? All of these things are structural parameters that will have a great impact on both your capacity and capability. Uh, finally, how are you working within the whole system to communicate, to educate? A lot of people think that if we just send people to training on quality, poof, it's going to magically happen, and that's very far from the truth. It takes a change in the fundamental system itself. So with that as a, as a foundation, what we want to do now is move on and talk specifically about these two notions of capacity and capability. Hi there. Thanks, Bob. Um, the, there's a big difference between capacity and capability. And as Bob uh, demonstrated on the arrow that talks about capacity, capability, and then sustainability and excellence, sometimes you have to think about that as steps on your journey. Because if you look at capacity, and um, Bob's, we've got on the slides here, some definitions. The ability to receive, hold, or, or absorb. That doesn't say anything about action, which falls into the capability. It's about maximum or optimum amount of production. 
the power and ability and possibility to do something. So think of a glass of water. Are you a half full or a half empty person? When you move to capability and thinking about what can you get these people to do and take action, it is about the ability to generate an outcome. You want them to be able to do something differently. It's not merely just absorbing information or knowledge, it is about taking action. And it's also about the ability to execute. You'll hear lots of different programs at an international forum like this. And people have their own style. It's very context-based, but we want them to take action on something. That's what capability is all about. It's expertise. And um, it's also about the skill and ability uh, to look at a certain project and do something differently. And these are some of the definitions of capability, but you've also got to think about the motives, beliefs and values within that system. I think we've got a Scottish Patient Safety Programme um, run chat on here that actually demonstrates when you do have capability, you could start producing your data in different ways, which is very different from just sitting and learning about how charts are made or hearing about other people's data. This is a, an article by Helen Bevan and she's really focused on uh, what capability really means, uh, capacity and capability really means in this article. And um, when Bob and I were discussing this at lunchtime today, we decided to underline the systematic approach. This is not about just sending people to the international forum or having a, a one workshop in your unit where you work. There's something about the plan that you're going to make to build capability in your organization that needs some uh, systems applied to it and also applied to the system. It's about looking at that system to see what you can do. And what Helen says is that capacity is about having the right number of people and the level of people who are actively engaged and able to take action. But capability is about people that have the confidence and knowledge and skills to lead that change. So it can be very different. You can build capacity because you have more people, but the capability is actually that action uh, point. And key questions, as we build through this session today, uh, we're going to give you not only some of the handouts, but key things that you can go back and ask your organization, or the folks, or the groups, the small groups and multidisciplinary teams that you work with. Who do you want to involve in this project, this uh, improvement intervention that you have? Is it everyone, or is it just a few individuals? What about the sequence for development? Is it going to happen, you'll have education and training programs within your hospital and healthcare community systems, but how are you going to use this to teach them more improvement skill? What about the methods you plan to use to build capacity and capability? You'll hear about lots of these and how people have used them, particularly the um, science of improvement expertise that you'll hear about in the forum. And what about the model or framework to guide your journey? This is about really laying down some plans, formalizing what you're going to do about capability. And how will you know that all of this sticks? That's Bob's part of the curve on the arrow for sustainability. We need to know that it's going to work. I'd say one of the major challenges is thinking about your model and framework. You know, today the, you hear a lot about Lean, Six Sigma at the IHI, we use something called the Model for Improvement to provide guidance. And I've seen too many health care organizations confuse the people actually in the organization because they get these exciting periods. Well, we're going to do Lean this month. And then somebody says, oh, next month we're doing Six Sigma. And then somebody says, no, we're doing Lean Six Sigma. And I've seen people come back and say, no, we're doing Six Sigma Lean. And it gets pretty confusing. So I think one of the points that Deming always tried to lay on his work with people was getting people to realize that one of the major issues that you have to deal with is constancy of purpose. So if every month you're coming up with a different model, a different framework, while that may seem 
useful for management because they're getting the latest ideas, the latest thinking. It is very confusing the people at the meso, middle levels, and micro level where work is actually being done. So of that list we, we offer, I would ask you to think about what are the frameworks, the model, what's the conceptual approach that you have to guide improvement? At the IHI, we are firmly grounded in the work of W. Edwards Deming. Other organizations have shown great success by anchoring their work on the work of Duran, on Lean, on Six Sigma. But the issue I've seen is that there is this hopscotching approach where people jump around and that leads to organizational confusion. The next big question is, who needs to be developed? You start at the top and build a cascade that drops down, or do you percolate up from the bottom? I want to tell you a wee bit of a story here from our friends in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, Saskatchewan is a very large province in the middle of Canada, and we've had the pleasure of working with a number of them in our improvement advisor program, and also going there to help them set up their quality strategies. Mary Smiley, uh, who is one of the directors for quality improvement as a graduate of our improvement advisor program. Uh, she is here doing programs in other sectors uh, while we're here today, actually. And Mary has been kind enough to share with me their strategy. And I love this notion of the cascade. That is, are you starting at the top and letting it trickle all the way down to the bottom? Or do you start and think about a different model. Some organizations I've seen start to train extensively at the senior management level. They send them off to courses, they bring in consultants. Other people I've seen starting from the bottom up where they do just the opposite. They train extensively with the staff. They send them to weeks of training and believe that that is the foundation. But then management doesn't get anything. Other organizations will say what we need to do is start in the middle, ground in those middle management folks and then use them as the buffer to move up the organization and down, integrating all the pieces. What approach do you have? Or do you even think about the approach that you have? Where do you start an organization and who needs to have that development? Does it start at the macro level, the meso or middle levels, or finally at the micro level? And what are you doing to bring each of these along? They all have different needs, they have different priorities, and they have different views of the world which you need to deal with to integrate. If you want to read more about this notion, I'd strongly recommend the book by Paul Batalden, Jean Nelson, and Marjorie Godfrey called Quality by Design, a view of the microsystem, where they talk about how this cascading approach works up and down the organization to effectuate change, particularly at the micro level. I'd say the second thing is, what do people need to know? Many organizations don't realize or appreciate, I would say, the fact that there are different skills, knowledges, theories that people have throughout the organization. And therefore, one size does not fit all. So you need to customize training, if you're into the training mode, for the physicians that is different than middle managers, that is different for the frontline staff. Do you have a program during your new orientation for employees that starts them right off the bat on their first day of work learning about the organization's commitment to quality and safety? Or do you spend that orientation session telling them how to fill out forms? It's a very interesting question when you get down to this skill level in which people are trying to build that capacity at individual levels, but if you're trying to do it with the same program for all people, it's probably not going to be too successful. This is one of the matrices that we've worked with our friends in Canada on to help them think about who needs to have what and why. And I would suggest that an analysis like this for your own organization would be a profitable place to start. So if we look at the who, we have point of service, people at the, the micro level, if you will. The micro level, bedside people. We have team leaders that might be more in the meso level, directors, supervisors. We might have a cadre of quality improvement experts, facilitators, improvement advisors, whatever you might call them. And then finally, there's this group of leaders at the top, which include board, governance, non-execs, a variety of people. And if you don't think about what each of these groups need to know and the depth then, in fact, it's going to be very hard to progress as a system. So one of my questions I have for you is, what are you doing to diagnose the needs at each level, find out what they currently know, and then what do they need to do their job as a member of this system aimed at quality improvement? 
Another example comes from our friends at Kaiser Permanente. They have been a strategic partner with us at the IHI for now over seven years. And what Kaiser Permanente has done is, first of all, develop a strategic plan that allows them to look at the desired outcome. That is, by their standards and by their vision, what they want to be is the safest, most efficient and effective and personalized healthcare system in the United States. What they've done is laid out these six dimensions. And these are fairly ge generic. So, I mean, you could take these yourself and actually apply them and ask, what are we doing in terms of leadership? What are we doing in terms of understanding the systems that we put in place and the subsystems? How are we doing about measurement? What is our learning, our knowledge management, and our learning system? Are you, as Peter Senge would say, a true learning organization, or are you just dabbling around the edges and sending people to a few training sessions now and then? Then what is our capacity? And finally, what is our culture that is allowing us to support this? Some of you may have heard the classic expression that culture eats strategy for lunch. Well, that's very true, especially so in healthcare settings where organizations haven't thought about what type of cultures do we have here? And you do, you have multiple cultures. There's not just one culture. You have multiple cultures even within a unit or a ward. And how do you manage that? Well, Kaiser has thought that through, and as we've worked with them over the years, uh, I've helped them develop what I start to call the dosing formula. And that is realizing that there are certain things that people need that are general knowledge that the whole system needs to have. So, Everyone needs to have a certain amount of shared knowledge that can be transported throughout the whole system by many people. And then as you move down this little diagram, there are change agents who in, consists of middle managers, stewards, project leaders, various types of facilitators at departmental or, or ward unit levels. There are operational leaders, directors, and executives. And finally, there are experts. This is then the group at the, the sharp end of this little diagram that are the ones that should have the deep knowledge of the science of improvement. These are the people who are few in number, typically, that are able to go out and work with the rest of all these groups to give them knowledge, tools, methods, techniques, etc. Now, this group of experts needs to have a specialized care and feeding and knowledge that, in fact, these folks over here don't need or require. The folks in the expert domain need to understand statistical process control. They need to have statistical methods. They need to know all the quality tools, etc. And these folks may not ever make a chart or need to, but they need to be able to understand when you show them a chart. Is that common cause, special cause? What would I do with data if we see data that are portraying things in a fashion that is showing we're getting worse rather than better? So as you think about your organization, how many people do you have that have different levels of knowledge? And have you ever thought about creating what I would call a dosing formula of who needs what in what amounts? This, like the Canadian example, is a, is a matrix that we've helped Kaiser create, and you'll notice they use a few different terms, everyone, the change agents, operational leaders, and experts, just like we saw in the prior diagram. But I spent a good year working with Kaiser, helping them fill out similar matrices to these that allowed them to say, yes, this group is going to get this dose and this amount for this long. And then we laid out a program and we've put, at this point, thousands of people at Kaiser Permanente through various levels of knowledge building, skill building, and the ability to execute. I would say that the characteristic for both the Canadian experience and the Kaiser Permanente experience is that all of this has been tied to work. None of these folks have attended programs where it is just learning for learning's sake. They must bring a project, they must involve work, and they must start applying the knowledge to the work. So we give them a little dose of knowledge, tools, or methods, then we send them out and they apply it to their project. Then they come back, they load data into the computer systems, they bring it back to a meeting, we process it, and ask them, how are you doing? So it's this cycle of learning, action, learning, action, learning, action. And that is a much more viable plan than just train, 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 train. 
Because those of you who, who know anything about adult education know that if you go to a learning session and get some basic lecture material converted to you, in fact, you probably forget about 80% of that within about four or five days of the session. But when you start applying it to work, which is a hallmark of what we do, then in fact that gets grounded. You test ideas, you test theories, and you're able to move forward. So I'd ask you then to think about this second exercise, what I call the dosing formula. <clears throat> I've given you a little rank ordered scale here. They need to know the basic terms and concepts. They need to be able to explain them. They need to be able to teach them. Or they need to be seen as organizational lead and a champion for making the terms, concepts, and methods actually alive in the day-to-day -day work of people. And so we created this little grid for you. What we'd like you to do is to think about these broad categories. And I have other versions of this that go on in great detail. So for people who join us for our year-long improvement advisor program, for example, there are several pages of this that get down into all the tools and methods you need to be a skilled quality facilitator or improvement advisor. And what I've done is kind of rolled these up into the big categories, which are the rows. So as we look at each group, and there are no right and wrong answers here, what I'd like you to do is think about, you know, what do the high level governance, non-execs, board members need? What do senior management need? Clinical leaders, middle management, the frontline staff, and then experts. What's an interesting activity to do with this particular exercise is take a leadership group within your own organization and send it out ahead of time and ask everybody to fill it out by themselves and then have them come together and compare answers or have them send you their completed forms and then you tabulate them and, and show some sort of compare and contrast. And as you might imagine, when you give this to multiple people and they fill it out independently, their view of the system may be quite divergent from somebody else's. And so it sets the context for dialogue. And how are we actually going to set up a concerted system that allows us to meet the various needs of the constituent groups that run our system, all of these folks, and then understand the knowledge and skill sets that they need in the aggregate. And anybody who would like to have the more detailed version of this that actually lists the tools, it goes through everything from functional deployment to Kaizen to statistical process control charts, data collection, sampling strategy. So I've got other ones that are very detailed. Today, Pat and I just wanted to give you this high level to start you thinking about who needs what within your own organizations. Okay. Pat, take them to Scotland. Thank you. Well, we're going to go to the Scotland very shortly, but um, in the plenary today, you heard Maureen Bisignano talk about the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, and this is actually the, the logo, every patient, every time, 24-7, uh, from the Scottish Programme that's in every acute hospital and actually spreading to primary care, community, mental health and maternity. And I would like to share with you some capacity and capability uh, work that we've done in country in partnership with IHI. Because uh, certainly it's true to say that IHI taught us everything that we know Not about improvement one. in Scotland. So I want to share with you that we had to ask ourselves the questions that Bob's posed today. Which is it? Is it more people or is it more skills and abilities? And it's actually not either or. It's both. We need to do something with both. So together with IHI, um, we built a program of capacity and capability building. And uh, you'll hear lots of different examples of that at the forum where some of the data from the patient safety program will be shared. But I just thought I would take you back to the very start of the NHS in the UK. And this is what Bevan said in 1948. And we can use that today. The expectations will always exceed capacity and the service must always be changing and growing and improving. So to be able to do that, we'll have to do something differently. But I thought I'd stop for a moment and I would actually take you to Scotland. How many people in the audience have been to Scotland? I can see some of my Danish colleagues over here as well. Great. So you'll know that Scotland is supposed to be in the airport when you either arrive at Scotland or you leave. It says it's the, the biggest little country in the world. 
And I'm sure you'll, you'll have seen and heard lots of these things I'm going to show you today. And it shows you how we build capacity, because I'm sure if you did see a, a piper or you heard, I actually heard bagpipes in the middle of Amsterdam, so we had to go and have a look at that the other day. But all of these things, if you've never been to Scotland, you must come and Bob and I will share some more stories when the session's finished about all the things that you can go and see. Um, Maureen Bizzignano's actually stood on this bridge here before she and her husband played golf. They're very famous for whiskey, but we don't talk about that too much in golf. And probably the fourth road bridge. And most importantly, probably this lady here. Everybody's heard of Susan Boyle. I'm not going to burst into song now, just in case you thought you would come along and hear that. But this is what Scotland looks like from a healthcare perspective. We've got 14 what's called territorial boards. They're not tartan, but I just made them look nice. And then we've got some special boards. I'll need to change that slide now because Quality Improvement Scotland is no more and Healthcare Improvement Scotland is the new organisation. We have 5 million people. The life expectancy is not very good. Women have the lowest in the European Union and men the next lowest to Portugal. So we'll have lots of work to do in relation to healthcare. But what we are trying to do is actually shift and narrow that curve in relation to quality improvement. And our um, colleagues at IHI have certainly helped us do that through the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. And we're trying to cut the tail off and extend that ambition, as Bob said, how good by when. We won't be able to do that unless we actually invest in people and sustain that improvement in education for the long term. We're in this for the long haul. So we have a new healthcare quality strategy and I'll be able to give you the electronic link to that and you can download that document. And our new quality aims are to make Scotland a world leader in healthcare quality improvement. And to do so, that is meaningful to all, to every member, every citizen of our five million people. This is what the document actually looks like, and it sets out our quality ambitions. It's about mutual beneficial partnerships with patients, the family and the public. It's about no avoidable injury or harm. Thanks to IHI and the Safer Patients Initiative and now the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, Scotland have actually been working on safety for nearly seven years. It, it, it does take a long time to build this capability. And it's also about the most appropriate treatments and interventions. You'll hear lots, I'm sure, at the International Forum about very wasteful activity in healthcare. And one of our ambitions is to remove that. Now, this is a bit of an eye test. It's even more of an eye test now that the screen's a bit blurred. But hopefully you've got these in your handouts and you'll be able to access them electronically. And this is one hospital system's approach to the healthcare quality strategy. So they've tried to spell out what do we need to do in safety, what we'll have to do in person-centred care, and how can we make our services more effective. So we thought we'd give you some practical examples that you can take back to your own hospital, build in your own language, and use that as a map to think about this capability building. The uh, healthcare quality strategy in Scotland is built around the six dimensions of quality. So this is not something new to you. We all know that these should be the principles by which every patient's treated. And we are going to use that in Healthcare Improvement Scotland as the basis by which we will be able to measure our impact right across the country in relation to interventions. But we do have a lot of people to engage. The NHS in Scotland is the largest employer. There's 170,000 employees with um, from a quality improvement perspective, we are needing 300 of these experts that Bob drew on his pyramid that was lying sideways. And 3,000 improvement advisors, that's our level of ambition by the end of the uh, Scottish Patient Safety Programme, which is not until December 2012, but we've still got a lot of work to do. So what would that hospital framework look like? I thought we'd share an example with you that this is a typical hospital. This is actually from NHS Tayside, and there's quite a few people, including in the audience today. 
So the leadership has to come from the CEO. So we had to invest certainly through the uh, Safer Patients, uh, Scottish Patient Safety Programme, some kind of categories where we're going to concentrate on at the macro, meso and micro level as Bob identified. And you can see that on this chart. I don't know if the, you can see it here that up here we've got the senior leadership and then we've got the meso level of directors, the clinical leads, the middle managers in here, they could be considered meso as well, and then right down into units, so different wards and departments within the hospital, this is actually going to be our plan. How many people can we now layer over that with this level of quality improvement expertise? Um, this is an IHI tool, it doesn't reference that at the bottom, but I'd like to draw that to your attention. An IHI help you to think about these three levels because they actually start to identify what do these people need to do in relation to the quality improvement expertise you're building. So when you look at senior leaders, their job is to build well. We've got to keep people trying to improve the entire organisation. The individual teams at MESO level, they're trying to make the improvements and test and learn about their own system and, and report the, the data in relation to the interventions that they're trying. And then there's the whole infrastructure of the hospital. How are they going to be involved from human resource perspective, technology, how are you going to capture information once you've built up this capability? These people are desperate to try and uh, use their data and change things uh, at, at the bedside. And also you need to build a system for spread. So you'll be able to start in one ward with a certain cohort of patients and, and use the uh, capacity and capability expertise there, but how are you going to use that right across the hospital? You're going to need some of these tools to make a formal plan. This is another IHI tool that helps you to think about how do you build well, generate ideas and execute change. And I think this is embedded in the spread, the white paper on spread as well, Bob. So I would advise you to download uh, that white paper because it really gives you tips that you can use in your own hospital system. Because you'll also have to build your capability plan thinking about who's already willing to make a change and, and to educate other people or collect that data for you. The quality strategy involves a number of different groups in Scotland. And some of these, uh, the national education uh, strategy comes from the National Education Scotland organisation. It's another of the special boards. And this is how we expect that we'll deliver the quality strategy in relation to some of these groups. I'm quite happy to share that with you um, at the end of the session. All right, thanks, Pat. I just want to add a couple other things in terms of what we've done in Scotland. As Pat said, we've worked uh, in, in small sectors starting for about seven years ago and we have been in earnest for the whole country. Scotland is the first country in the world to step forward to say we're going to change the whole country. And every hospital consisting of these boards that Pat mentioned is involved with this program. And it was not voluntary. It was everybody in the whole country is going to join in. And we have had a number of capacity building activities over the years. And I would say the parallel for you is to think about whether you're a single hospital, a multi-hospital organization, a province, a region, how are you actually going to deploy, once again, in a cascading kind of manner, up and down? We have had seven learning sessions, right? Yes. Yep. And we're working on the eighth. So over the, well over three years, we've had seven learning sessions where we had 700 plus people come from all of the hospitals to either uh, join us uh, live and in person or through video links, some. Uh, we've recorded these and people use them to take back to the sites to continue the learning and training. We've been working in five work streams, clinical critical care, clinical general ward, clinical perioperative, medicines management, and then leadership and culture. And then we've been at this so long that we're now expanding into pediatrics, congestive heart failure and other clinical domains that people feel are interesting that 
need to be spread. But we've also had a number of capacity building sessions. I've been running now for the past year an improvement advisor program that is for about 30 people, several from each board and several from governmental agencies that are getting a deep dive in the science of improvement with us. I then have run a three-day program that was linked then to WebEx follow-up sessions where people came for three days, we had about 200 people at that, where they brought projects, work on them, then we followed up on these action calls. It, it might be worth adding, Bob. We, we did this for uh, two years in one hospital system first. So, so we didn't spread it right across the country until we knew it could work in context. And as Maureen's uh, slides this morning I demonstrated teach and learn, I'm sure uh, my colleague Jakub, I can see in the audience, would say that Scotland and Denmark actually developed a relationship. So that would certainly be something we would put on our map that we share and learn between programs um, in other parts of Europe already. So and, you, know, you also, I wanted to come back to your sure. comment about the um, learning sets that Bob mentioned before, where you need to bring people together and then they go out and take action. This is not just about coming to a conference. It's about setting the pace of what levels of intervention we're going back to do. So I, I thought it was Yeah, important. and even when we structured these, I mean, if you look at a learning session, very different than this conference. So these learning sessions, we would have small lectures even in a plenary sense for the large group. And then there would be breakouts for all of the clinical areas where they would actually roll up their sleeves and start talking about central line infections, bloodstream infections, hand washing compliance, use of S-bar, and they actually were doing work in subgroups. So uh, we would encourage you to think about the different modalities. And again, I don't care if you're changing a country, a region, a hospital. It's a matter of scale that you have to deal with there. But the concepts and the approach are different. We've got a large scale activity going. We've started one in Denmark with a hospital in each of the five regions and we'll be expanding to larger settings. We've been working in Jönköping, Sweden for over 12 years now. And so one of the things that I think you need to think about is this is not a silver bullet. And so a lot of groups say, we're doing quality, we've sent people to the conference, how come things aren't better? Well, our point is that they probably aren't thinking about the system, they're thinking about individual components, and they haven't put together a structured, sustainable process by which this stuff gets cascaded up and down and sideways through the organization. It's both a vertical and a horizontal activity. Now, we've put a lot of material in front of you in a short period of time because we wanted to reserve a, a good amount of our time for you to continue to this work. I've shown you two worksheets. We're now going to use an instrument and give you some time to actually work on this and the next instrument after that to find out where you really stand in light of where you want to be. At the IHI we've been working for about the last year uh, a small group myself, a fellow by the name of Gareth Perry, who's one of our senior scientists, uh, and some of the research staff, on putting together this self-assessment. We did a literature search and looked at everything from the European Quality Awards to the Baldridge Awards to other types of quality assessments that uh, were done in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and elsewhere. We put together this worksheet, and so I'm going to explain the worksheet to you, and then I'm going to have you start filling it out. This is more or less the preamble to this. Those of you familiar with our improvement map at the IHI, we're currently restructuring some of the software to put this instrument up on the improvement map so a broader audience will also be able to do it. We've alpha and beta tested this for reliability and validity, and we feel pretty comfortable that it gives you a, a, a fairly accurate understanding of what we think are six of the key areas that you need to think about. Namely, leadership, results, the resources you're committing, workforce and human resources issue, data, infrastructure and management, and finally, improvement knowledge and competencies. What we've done is to put together this little worksheet. 
And what I'm going to do in a moment is ask you to start filling this out. Now, you will definitely need the uh, handouts for this particular activity so you can read the context. Unlike putting a number of, you know, circle a, a Likert type scale, what we've done here is we've taken these six areas that I just highlighted. And we ask you to think about whether you're just beginning, developing, making progress, making significant progress, or exemplary. Now these concepts are fairly vague, so some might say, well, what do you mean by these? This is where we put the work together. What we did was we laid out, in kind of a Delphi technique, the underlying ideas that would capture the concept of just beginning, of developing of making progress significant and exemplary. And so these text boxes actually explain to you what it would be like if you were at an organization and you could just walk around, observe meetings, talk to people, look at meeting agenda, topics, etc. What would you see people doing if they were just beginning? Now interestingly enough, as you can imagine, most people when you ask them how they're doing, they write a way say, we are doing excellent. We are an exemplar. People should be beating a path to our door and asking us if they can come and see how great we are. Well, in reflection, if you're honest with yourself, you're probably somewhere between these. And so for each of the characteristics, for example, the leadership one and the results ones are shown here, there are descriptors. And so the way this instrument works is you're asked to think about which of these things you are doing. And the comparative operational definition of beginning, developing, etc., are here. So what you do on this little worksheet, you don't put a number in, you just have a dialogue today amongst yourself or with your colleagues if they're here and when you go back with a larger body, and then make some decision about on leadership for improvement. I'd say we're developing and our results and we're just beginning. We're not getting results. We're committing a lot of resources and our workforce, I'm not sure where they are, so I'll put them at developing. Our data infrastructure, we just got a new system, so I think we're strong there. And our improvement knowledge and competency, we are, well, maybe we're off the board here. We're not there yet. So it's, it's merely a context for a dialogue. And if you understand the true nature of dialogue, dialoguing is not an idle chit chat. It's not a debate. It's not a discussion. A dialogue, if you understand the true nature of what people like David Bohm and his colleagues wrote about the nature of dialogue, is an exploration of theories, assumptions, and your views of the world. And so one needs to be open to theories. If you're, if you're doing this and you're sitting in a meeting and somebody goes, well, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard you say, you're probably not setting up the context for a dialogue. So one needs to be able to be open to explore theories because if you're serious about this quality improvement journey, in fact, you've got to explore what you're doing, why you're doing it, and the assumptions that you have behind it. So for the next five or 10 minutes, we'd like you to take this little worksheet and use these descriptors. There's several pages that cover all six. There's two on each page describing what it would look and feel like just beginning to exemplary for these six characteristics. And then if you do have the opportunity, because you have knowledge and, or you have someone with you, you could provide a brief description shown over here of the type of data or other evidence that you use to inform your choice. So if you say we have great results, I would expect to see you show me a control chart that says we used to have central line infections that look like this. And then we started working on quality. And in fact, they dropped to here. And then we did some other things and it dropped to here. And now we're so good that we no longer look at our central line bloodstream infection rate we actually plot the number of days that have gone by without an infection because it's become a rare event at our place. So I'd want to see some evidence, not just anecdotal, gee, I think we're great, and we had a nice article written up in the local newspaper about how good we are and how we saved the life of one patient that came into our trauma unit. You know, That's great, 
but if you're really looking to transform the system, it's a much broader context. So we're going to give you a few moments, and this is one of those participation moments, all right? when you come to these. Uh, we'd like you to take some of the ideas we've been sharing with you about capacity and capability and start thinking in earnest about where you are on this little assessment scale. All right? So hop to it, and we'll check with you in a few minutes. All righty. Now, with the help of our roving microphone, I want to get some thoughts and reflections from people. Uh, you've done several of these exercises now, the first one broad, and then this dosing formula. Uh, so let's hear from some of you on either where you found some insights using this uh, particular exercise or some of the other ones. And uh, we have a microphone. Just raise your hand. and. Let's, let's get, I know it's a large kind of vacuous spot we have here, but let's, uh, let's get a little commentary. In Scotland, Bob, we bribe them with money. <laughs> Do you have extra that you brought with you? No, I was banking on you. No, right. <laughs> Come on, any insights that people have had about where they are? Or just tell us the story of, in light of some of these things, uh, where might you go and what you've learned? Thank you. There, so we have a hand over here. So, okay, here comes Ms. Microphone. So tell us where you're from, please, uh, right, right here. And uh, give us some insights. Uh, I'm, my name's Gemma. I'm, I work in Cardiff in Wales. Okay. Um, I find this exercise very depressing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what I realize is that in, it's a large organization, but I think we're still working in silos. So we've got some evidence of very good practice in some areas, and it, clearly we are not spreading it. So um, I think we need to take that back to our organization and, and look at the leadership in general, okay, because it's difficult to spread when you're in your own directorates because you're not responsible for other directorates. So it's hard to get that good practice spread. And so, what are some of the things that you're doing well that you okay. you think you could build on? Well, we were very fortunate to be part of the Safer Patient Initiative too, and through that work, uh, we haven't had a centre line infection in critical care since 2007. So that's wow. quite significant. But I don't know what other areas within the organization are doing with that knowledge and, um, and how, if they're applying the improvement work. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have any structures that would allow what you've done in that area to be shared with? I mean, mm -hmm. people may not even know about what you've done here. Um, well. Like many places, we've gone through a massive reorganization. And I think we've, recent, we've appointed an improvement lead for the organization. Um, but I haven't really made a connection there. OK. Well, don't be too depressed. At least it'll give you a framework for seeing what you have to do. I, I think you bring up two really important points. First, I'm sure there are other organizations in the audience have intensive care units that do still have central line infections. So four years without any infections is fantastic work. The second thing is you're absolutely right when you say that one unit over here can't be responsible for spread. We have to be able to build capability in that other part of the organization because you need to do your day job in the area that you work. And if you come away from there, that might affect the reliability of practice. So you bring up two very common problems when people start to spread improvement programs across the organization. And I think another point, you know, your first comment that this is depressing. We never developed that exercise to think that the outcome would be depression. Uh, maybe we need a depression scale on it after you finish it. But I think what you've just described, though, is the lack of systems thinking. So you're working well in one area. Mm -hmm. 
and you're suboptimizing or, or not maximizing the, the work in other areas that could learn. How about some other thoughts or reflections? Come on, we need at least one more. I saw several of you actually filling the form out, so there must be some thoughts. Yes, please. Yeah, my name is Michael Angulile from uh, Tanzania, East Africa. Welcome. Uh, reflecting on this tool, uh, I got another rethinking of uh, our accountability, the issue of uh, capacity and the capability. Uh, in our efforts of addressing the human resource crisis in health, then uh, after listening to what it entails to assess capacities and capabilities, I got another impression that maybe we are just beginning because mm -hmm. the orientation we had and what I had here is really an eye opener to okay. think on our strategies. So I saw another approach and another thinking. Okay. In terms of leadership was and the whole issue of uh, the workforce. Uh, human resources. Yeah, and you, you raise an interesting point that one doesn't have to necessarily have a lot of money to do this. I mean, we've done a lot of work in Malawi and Ghana and South Africa where there are major, major resource challenges, and yet the, the goodwill of the people and the interest in getting better have been able to achieve marvelous things. Maureen showed you a little bit of our work in Ghana today. Uh, in Malawi, there's a project called Mikanda, which involves mothers and babies. We've uh, worked on something called Five Alive, reducing the malaria incidence that kills children uh, and trying to get them to stay alive past this magical age of five when many of them die in some of these countries. And the issue here is not about money. We've seen countries throw large amounts of money into, quote, capacity and capability building, and they don't get much of a return. And yet we've seen places that have fewer and limited resources, but they have the right mix of ingredients. I think Thank you, you also bring up a very uh, common uh, understanding of once you have a tool and you start to think about where you are on that improvement map in relation to capability, I'm sure lots of people drift towards only just beginning because you often think that things are better than they are, and only when you have a tool, you can say, well, it's not really that good. We really are right at the beginning again. I'm sure that lots of people in the audience would share that with you. Any other thoughts or reflections before we move on? In the back there, please. Hello. I'm Mary Phillip from United Arab of Emirates. I'm working at Sheikh Khalifa Medical City, which is managed by Cleveland Clinic. And uh, I'm in the primary health care clinic, and we are having a committee for quality. And we do, on a monthly basis, assessment of the percentage of health maintenance issues, like uh, how, how long or how often this patient had uh, uh, been checked for hemoglobin A1C mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, how long he has been seen by or how far he has been seen by an ophthalmologist or uh, in diabetes how far he is controlled and uh, so we have these measurements and we have to give on monthly basis uh, how far we do we go for health maintenance issues in each age and they audit we, we do this mm -hmm. on auditing basis to see the outcome if it's improving or not and we have for every age like a mammogram and the, like a, a PSA for uh, pap spears all sorts or all issues of health maintenance in different age groups so, um, and I, we had the JCIA okay. uh, yeah. ac accreditation last year for the hospital. We are going to the JCIA accreditation for the PhDs this year. Good. So you're looking for ways to not only develop new ideas, but by going through these external evaluations, you're looking for ways to standardize 
so that it does become part of a fabric of everyday life, right? So that it's not just a, what we would say, a flash in the pan. It happened once, you got a good mark, but now you're looking for ways to sustain it, which is clearly a hallmark of moving from capacity, capability to, to the next level. And uh, also we have on yearly basis for renewal of our contracts, we have to sit for mandatory sessions for BLS, uh, uh, things like auditing, de dealing with fires, dealing with uh, uh, back pain, dealing with uh, codes, dangerous codes like the ACLS, BLS, uh, all these uh, codes. So we have this mandatory for every uh, employer, employee in the hospital. So it also sounds like you're working from the macro down to the micro levels within the yes. organization too. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. We have one more down front here. Yeah. Come on down. Put your hand up again so she can find you, please. Mm -hmm. Hey, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Ellen Dala from the Netherlands. I work at Sun and Ray. Um, I'm working on this moment with a lot of people on a national program on, uh, of health improvement in care. And what puzzles me is um, the question of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a question about uh, the stage before this approach. Um, what if you want to uh, create a large impact on uh, improvement, improvement in healthcare? How can you create commitment between all the leaders of all the hospitals and the long-term um, homes, etc., etc.? It's that's we think it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. What? How can you influence that the leaders are co yeah are committed to this kind of approach? I'm going to turn to um, Pat for that because uh, Pat, you've had to yeah. deal with this at a national level. Um, Going back to the slide that Bob had with the triangle, where do you start at the top of the organization, do you start at the bottom, or do you start in the middle? I think it depends on how large your program is. I know that's a bit of a, a cop-out, but I'm going to come back to answer that. In the um, Safer Patients Initiative and the Scottish Patient Safety Program with IHI, we actually do all three. We have the leaders there, we have some of the middle managers there, some senior clinicians, junior doctors, students, and frontline staff. And we bring them together as a group, in a hospital group, so that these people need to work together. Because you're absolutely right, if the, if the frontline staff are actually trying to improve, and that data or that information is never going up for leadership support, then it's very difficult to sustain because the leader needs to really understand why the hospital system or primary care system needs to invest in this activity. So I, I would say you need clear goals for your program and then think about who needs what knowledge to be able to continue with that intervention to increase reliability, to improve safety, whatever the, the project or program is. But I think you need some of all of these. And I don't I also don't think it matters where you start. Context is everything. Because what happens in the Scottish Patient Safety Programme might not work completely in the same way in the Netherlands. You need to start that in a different way. But there's lots of learning, leader to leader, peer to peer, that can go on in relation to that. So I think you do need some leaders. And the leader does need to understand what the long-term aims and goals of that particular quality improvement intervention is. I think the, the notions that Maureen was presenting this morning, remember she talked about uh, the need for new leadership that had some new characteristics. Uh, if you're a leader that is focused on command and control, uh, you're probably not going to feel real comfortable with a lot of the, the thinking that is underneath quality improvement strategies. Uh, and what we find is that there is a lot of training that has been done that really doesn't address the leadership issues and how a leader needs to create an environment for growth and then step back 
Too many leaders want to micromanage, and that is a, almost a universal characteristic. I think the other thing that I've noticed, uh, you know, United States does not have a health care system. We have a sickness system that works pretty well when you have to go in the hospital, but as Maureen was saying, we don't do a lot about population health uh, as national health systems, as many of you have. And as a result, there's both pros and cons to that. So the problem I see as an outside observer of national health systems with leadership is that the lightning bolts come down from Mount Olympus and then the providers are hit with them and then they say, well, they are telling us to do this. So right away there's this confrontational social milieu in which you're trying to create growth. Uh, I had the pleasure last evening of meeting with about 35 folks from Sweden that organize and run the national registries and Sweden has one of the best set of registries uh, in the world and we had a kickoff gathering uh, we're gonna have more meetings to talk about how can you use these national registers and national databases that are aggregated data oftentimes at aggregated points in time to get people to do improvement because uh, many times these are used uh, again, as directives down, uh, and, and people get in more confrontation. They don't see the leadership role. So I think it involves new leadership concepts, working, as Pat says, up and down the line, and then using data effectively to understand the magnitude of what you're doing. I think uh, linking to the other lady's point about spread, it's definitely the leader's job to spread because it's very difficult for one unit to spread to another. And I think Maureen said that this morning, that the leader's job is to spread the initiative. And it's also the leader's job to remove barriers. And we're going to come on to that yeah. shortly. Well, it's a great lead in. Yep. Take us there. OK. Um, this slide here, we need to think about what, what we've tried to get you to do this morning is think about where we currently are. So in your quality improvement work, what is the current position? Some of these tools that we've shared with you today will actually help you to determine what the starting point is for different aspects of your quality improvement work. And, and then you need to set out that level of ambition that Bob talked about, how good by when. So once you set these quality improvement aims, you'll need to be able to work out a system. How do you bridge that gap? How are we going to get there with the current workforce that we have? And how are we going to invest in these people to be able to enable them to continue to do this quality improvement work? Um, I don't think we're going to have time to go. Are we going to have time? Probably not. Just no. set it we're up. We're not going to have time because we finish at uh, 3 o'clock. Um, so the force field analysis uh, tool in your worksheet will actually help you to do that. It will help you to understand what are the barriers to success here. And also, um, what do we need? What is compelling us to move forward? Is there a high infection rate in a unit where we need some quality <laughs> improvement expertise to set up a system to monitor that? Or how can we learn from a system? I think your example about zero um, central line infections was fantastic. What, what good practice is going on in that unit and how can we learn from that? So you can use the force field analysis worksheet to identify these two forces. And I'm sure uh, many people in the audience have used something like this before. What are the driving forces that we're going to need and what are the restraining forces? So it's barriers and benefits in relation to that and the actions to reduce the restraining forces, we need to do something differently. And how are we going to reduce these? And your leaders certainly will, will play a role in that. So in wrapping up, I think it's important to think about the ingredients. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this little formula. It was developed by a gentleman by the name of Avidus Donabedian, who is a world-class physician thinker who unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, but he wrote in the early 80s a two-volume set before Deming was ever very well known uh, in the healthcare arena about quality improvement, quality management, integrating risk management, quality issues. And Don Abedian pointed out very clearly that 
whether you're at the macro, the middle level, meso, or micro level, that structures plus processes equal outcome. So if the outcome is that you want to be an excellent organization that has sustainable quality and safety improvement, that builds on capacity, capability, and all the knowledge that could come from that, in fact, you need to think about the structures you have in place and the processes you put in place. Too many people want the outcomes. And they don't do diligence on putting together the structures and the process that drive it. So if Pat came to me for blood pressure management and I said to Pat, I want lower blood pressure, Pat, get lower blood pressure, I'm not going to be happy with you, I'm not going to be your doctor unless you get that blood pressure under control. I would never improve her outcome unless I understood the structures and the processes that she engages in. What's the family history, the structures, the genealogical structures that she brings to the party? What's her daily process? Does she take in alcohol, tobacco? What's her daily intake of fat, sodium, and cholesterol? Does she exercise? All of these things, the structures and the process, combine to produce her outcomes. The same thing can be done for an organization. If you have not put in the structures and the processes that are conducive to building a quality environment, you can harp to your face turns blue that you want quality. We are a quality organization, etc., but it never will come to fruition. At the IHI, we use three things to help us organize our work around this. Will, ideas, and execution. And it's interesting if you ask people how they see themselves laying out in this regard. And I've literally done this around the world, and the results are surprisingly similar, irrespective of the culture, the economic structure, the state of development. So when I ask healthcare people, where do you stand in terms of the will to change? What do you think people say, low, medium, or high? High. All right, I, I, heard a, I did hear some lows, I heard some mediums, and I heard a few highs. Well, what's interesting is that right off the bat, most people say somewhere between medium and high. And yet, upon closer inspection and dialogue, people oftentimes start moving themselves back down this little continuum. I was working with a large physician group one time, and they immediately all said, we have high will to change. And the leader, the chief medical officer, said, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, he said, let me offer you an alternative. And I wish I would have had a camera to film this guy. He said, first of all, I have not seen a lot of change around this organization. We've had great success, and we're a large group, but basically healthcare is a very conservative, traditional, hierarchical business that is not known for change and innovation. And I, I just kind of... And he, he went on to articulate that. And finally, he said, now, let's all vote again. He says, you know, I've heard from you, and he would point out to an individual, said, I've heard you say those people need to change, that you're doing fine. And he says, I have data that can show you that you're not as great as you think you are. Sometimes people are legends in their own mind. <laughs> and so he asked them to vote again. And where do you think they put themselves? In a more realistic sense because we aren't known for the rapidity and innovative change. Some of you probably know about the articles that say it takes on the average about 17 years for a good clinical medical practice to actually be put into everyday play. Where do you think people put themselves on ideas? Low, medium, or high? Yeah, medium, high, and I think that's a fairly accurate assessment. There's been some meta-studies that have shown that we end up having upwards of about 10,000 articles of different sorts in medical and healthcare related magazines and journals every month. That's a very difficult thing to even manage. So we almost wallow around in ideas, and the issue is how do you pick them? How about on this last one, execution? Where do you think people put themselves? Low. And that again, is a rather universal response. Matter of fact, I had one guy stick his hand up one time and said, do you have like negative numbers down here? Which prompted another guy to stick up his hand and say, well, actually, there's some people I know that I'd like to execute. I think we'd get better. And I said, but that's not the kind of execution we're talking about here. And he goes, oh, all right. 
What's interesting, though, is if you do find that you have decent will, and I think we're in a profession that should foster will. You know, you ask people, why did you get into health care? And they say, because we wanted to what? Help people, right? So, I mean, the foundation, theoretically, is there. We have availability of good ideas, and you need to learn the skills to execute. And a lot of that is about capacity and capability building. So, as you think about these issues, we hope that we have planted a few ideas, clarified a few, given you some worksheets that you can take home and start to think about. Please don't hesitate to follow up and get in touch with us. Uh, you can come up and get one of our cards or talk to us during uh, the breaks and the receptions, etc. Uh, but we wish you well in that journey. And just end with a, a rather ancient quote that still has a great deal of relevance, that it is not an act but a habit that in fact creates constancy of purpose and sustainability for quality and safety and we wish you well on that journey. Thank you very much for joining us.